Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar, or TOPS. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Alex Lieber, a tobacco researcher and assistant professor at Georgetown University's Lombardi Comprehensive Cancer Center. TOPS is organized by Justin White from University of California, San Francisco, Mike Pesco from Georgia State University, C. Sean from Ohio State University, and Catherine McLean from Temple University. The seminar will be one hour with questions for the moderator and discussant, the audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. Now, I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Catherine McLean from Temple University to introduce our speaker. Today, we continue our spring 2022 season with a workshop presentation by Shaying Ma entitled, How to Scrape Online Information, which applica with application to online vape shops. Dr. Shaying Ma is a, the Pelotonia Fellow at the Center for Tobacco Research at The Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center. She is a health economist studying substance use, health policy, and health-related behaviors. Her research is focused on e-cigarette tax structures, tax burdens on different tobacco products, access to paid leave in the workplace, and disparities in cancer management. Dr. Ma is expanding her research in substance use behaviors and health policy with a focus on the LGBTQ2 populations. She is currently funded by OSU's Pelotonia Fellowship Program to examine LGBTQ tobacco disparities in the U.S. Our discussant today is Dr. Mike Pasco from Georgia State University. Dr. Ma, thank you for presenting for us today. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess I'll share my screen. So can everyone see my slide okay? Yes. Great, thanks. Um, thank you very much. I'm very excited to be presenting uh, this workshop, how to scrape online information with application to online workshops. Um, I am Shai Ma and I am a second year postdoc at the Ohio State Center for Tobacco Research. I want to thank my collaborators because this web scraping project um, is a team science efforts um, between folks in the Ohio State Center for Tobacco Research, uh, the Ohio State University Com uh, Department of uh, Computer Science and Engineering, and also um, folks at College of Public Health. We want to disclose that this project is funded by the Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center Center for Tobacco Research Pilot Study Mechanism, and we declare no conflict of interest. Now, I want to give you an overview of um, this workshop on uh, e-cigarette data collection from online stores. Um, first, I'll talk a little bit um, to motivate um, the use of web scraping tools. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk about how uh, exactly we uh, scrape from uh, online stores and what kind of information we get. So we can extract a variety of information from the online stores, including price, uh, volume, uh, in stock status, price promotion. We also have access to, uh, we are able to get nicotine strength and nicotine form, uh, whether it being free base or salt. We are also able to extract information like VJPG ratio and um, very rich and complex information of the product flavors, and we're able to scrape data on the brands. Uh, we are also able to um, uh, obtain the package images from those on our web shops and we are able to extract information um, to do policy relevant analysis from those images. Uh, and lastly, we are able to uh, extract information from the consumer numeric, numeric readings and also we have access uh, to the review contents for each uh, e-cigarette product listed by uh, each online web shop in our sample. So now motivation, so why do we need to collect e-cigarette product information from online stores? Uh, so I want to um, 
talk a little bit about, uh, so first of all, the sales data that we know, we know that sales data are necessary to describe the marketplace and inform policies at federal, state, and local levels. Uh, however, existing sales data, such as Nielsen retail standard data, only capture a portion of the market. So what Nielsen data covers uh, is um, convenience stores, gas stations, grocery stores, drug stores, uh, pharmacies, and mass merchandiser outlets. So basically brick and mortar stores in the, um, in the Instagram market. So we need surveillance of Instagram products sold in specialty web shops and online stores um, so that we can capture the full spectrum of uh, Instagram products in the marketplace. Uh, now, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, how consumers purchase uh, their e-cigarettes in the U.S. And as you can see from this table, um, that is based on a uh, Bradley Tell's study, uh, studies in 2006, uh, 2019 and 2020, uh, you can see that uh, online market uh, is, is a substantial portion of the whole e-cigarette market. And 23% of adults make their uh, e-cigarette purchases online. And uh, adolescents and young adults, uh, younger than legal age, 16% uh, of them buy their e-cigarettes online. And for adolescents and young adults who are, um, who are at or above legal age, 14% of them buy their e-cigarette products online. So online uh, stores is a very important purchasing, purchasing channel in terms of e-cigarette products. So there are several methods and existing databases to conduct surveillance of e-cigarette products sold online and in retail shops. And despite their uh, importance and usefulness, uh, each of them has some li limitations. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about existing data sources and how uh, we hope to address some of their limitations through our web scraping tools. So first is that um, we, uh, like there is data from tobacco service containing product related uh, questions. However, um, those survey data could be subject to self uh, reported errors, uh, biases. And also uh, we know that um, like uh, the Instagram products are very heterogeneous. So they're becoming a variety of packet pack sizes and volumes. So unlike, uh, unlike combustible tobacco, they could be um, challenging to memorize, uh, like asking the re respondents to memorize the package, uh, the pack size and volume size uh, of their purchase. In addition, we know that e-cigarettes have different models. Um, they can be sold as disposables, rechargeables, pods, and uh, cartridges. So um, in summary, it could be hard for the respondents to correctly uh, recall and remember um, their e-cigarette purchases. There, all, there is also this powerful uh, tool, the standardized tobacco assessment for retail settings uh, with shops, with store surveillance tool. And um, it, is a, it's, it is a useful and standardized uh, tool to get data from retail stores. Uh, however, it can be costly for, um, for the users of the tool to train research staff to visit stores and document information. And also, um, typically, each store visit by the staff members can only capture the most um, popular brands or the commonest of brands. So it's hard to document all the products available in those retail stores um, during store visits. There is, there is also the method of uh, brand website surveillance. However, it is subject to the sampling of the brands. So it depends on uh, brand mentions uh, to obtain a predetermined list of brand websites. And um, as a result, it can miss out some smaller brands, um, emerging brands that may take off and become very pop popular in the near future. There's also uh, the very useful tool of uh, social media surveillance. However, it does focus more on the marketing instead of uh, getting marketplace data. So we hope that uh, uh, the web scraping tools to obtain e-cigarette data from online market could um, complement alternative methodologies um, as it is not subject to self-reported errors as we're 
um, scraping data from mana stores using algorithms. And uh, through that approach, we are able to capture a wide range of products, essentially everything listed by those on our workshops. And also it can capture a wide range of brands. We don't need a predetermined brand list to get to this data. Uh, and through web scraping, we can get data to complement the existing marketing data with marketplace data. And also, since we do have data on consumer ratings, in a way, um, consumer ratings can reflect consumer reception of marketing. And also, I'm going to show you briefly that some of uh, uh, the data we have can also reflect the marketing of those online stores. So we use uh, web scraping tools um, to hopefully complement news and retail scanner data from the brick and mortar stores. Um, despite the importance uh, of news and data, it can take a lot of efforts to identify product information based on UPC, and it could be a costly process to obtain information such as nicotine strength and flavors. With um, the web scraping algorithms, we can actually automate and streamline the process. So we can very straightforward, straightforwardly obtain uh, a variety of um, product information such as nicotine strength uh, and very comprehensive and rich uh, information on product flavors. And this process is relatively costless. So um, in today's um, workshop, I'm going to talk about um, the extraction and analyze of data from five stores. However, we can easily expand um, to more, much more stores without um, much additional costs with the already developed uh, algorithms. So what uh, this web screening project does is that we're trying to address the data limitation in Instagram marketplace. So we script data from online uh, stores. We are able to have access to a variety of um, a variety of information, such as uh, prices, price promotion, nicotine strength, uh, nicotine form, the ratio of VG to PG, uh, flavors, brands, images, consumer ratings and reviews. And in today's workshop, uh, I'm going to focus on our analysis on e-liquid e products. However, we were also able to obtain uh, disposables, devices, starters. So we do we do have those data, and they are in the process of being cleaned. Now I want to describe a little bit about um, the details of our methodology. So first, uh, how did we select those uh, five online workshops in our sample? So we searched on Google and Reddit using the key terms "best online waiting stores" in 2020, and we did that on a search in, uh, on January 26, 2021. And then we went ahead and selected three stores from our Google search and two stores um, from Reddit search. So they are basically recommendations um, by Wapers on that online forum. And then uh, the next step is that we confirmed that these five stores sell products nationwide in the US they sell to most states in the US through mailing or shipping services. And then we went ahead and scraped product data from those online stores between February and May 2021. And in total, we have data of uh, over 14,000 unique products from five stores. And keep in mind, these are only the unique e-liquid products from five stores. So if we count uh, all the other product types, that will be much more. So we do want to mask uh, the store identities and refer to them as stores one to five in our analysis. So uh, here I'm going to show you how um, those popular online workshops list their products in comparison to, for example, um, the store shelf on um, brick and mortar stores. Now I'm gonna um, walk you through uh, what is contained uh, in, in the data of um, a specific store website. So let's take store one as an example. 
So there is an uh, age verification when you visit the website. So you um, type in the address and then what pops up is uh, a question asking you, are you over 21 and also of legal age of sm smoking in state of residence? And if you are and you click on yes and you enter the website, um, you do see an e-cigarette health warning on the homepage. And what you also see on the homepage is multiple tabs indicating different e-cigarette types that they carry. So here I'll show you the layout of ASCO One's homepage. So as you can see what I circled and used uh, red arrows to indicate, um, so they have multiple tabs for uh, e-liquids, disposables, kids and malls, and CB CBD products that they carry. Now, in terms of web scraping tools, so here I show you a screenshot of uh, Python code. So we used uh, two tools. Um, one is the Chrome extension web scraper. Uh, it is free to access and use, and also the other is Python. So um, the web scraping procedure itself is pretty standard. And now to show you the source code from Snow One's website. So you can visit um, a specific uh, web page of store one and you can access uh, the source code. I believe if you're using um, Chrome as your browser, then you click on the three dots on the right, uh, right upper right corner of your uh, browser and then you click on developer, developer tools and you see the source code. And in here, as an example, you can see um, in the source code, there are information such as original price, and also current price. So we're able to get e-cigarette prices and also through those, um, uh, those I guess, those two variables, we're able to calculate price promotion um, in the form of percentage of. And um, you can see that uh, in store one, uh, so for a specific e-cigarette product, it does have product details. So it tells you what is, um, what is included, uh, it includes a one bottle of uh, 120 milliliters, uh, no hype butter pecan e-liquid, and also it has specifications and features. So it um, lists its PGVG ratio and also its primary flavors. And you can access all of those information on, on a webpage of that store through the source code. And here is an overview of uh, all those information, like they're intuitively from the web page. So you can uh, see the product name, volume, you're able to scrape brand. So the brand is no hype and you can see the original price, current price, and um, you can obtain the product image through the web scraping process. By choosing a nicotine level, you will be able to see the available options of this specific um, liquid product in terms of its nicotine levels. And then if you scroll down to product details, you're gonna see um, here is a short description of this product. And again, what's included and also with GPG ratio and primary flavors. Now, if you go to the second tab, which is reviews right uh, next to product details, you're gonna be able to scrape data such as um, the ratings. So here is four point Seven out of five, you'll be able to scrape number of reviews um, and also review contents of each user or a consumer and also images of their reviews. And now with access to um, organic online store traffic, so we do want to keep monitoring the popularity of stores in our sample. And also um, using those um, organic store traffic data, we'll be able to expand our efforts and scrape data from more stores and also stores with the greatest traffic. So we'll be able to capture um, the most popular uh, online stores over time. So that would ensure the representativeness um, of the data so that it reflects the rapidly changing online market. Now I'm going to show you briefly uh, how the data looks like. So after you scrape the data from uh, the store website, you'll be able to save it as a, a CSV file. You can 
access it as a spreadsheet. So uh, what you see here is that you can um, arrange the data so that uh, the data are in columns and in column B, those are the product images, column C is the product name and sometimes it contains um, the brand name and also volume. And column D is price, column E is original price, column F is product volume. And also um, there are more columns, uh, of course, um, after column F uh, showing the other attributes. And you can see this, this kind of um, data in spreadsheet is very easy to, uh, to read, to access, and also to process in software programs such as data. So after obtaining um, price data of e-liquid products, so we do want to standardize our e-liquid uh, e price. So what, I, what we do is that um, we calculate the standardized price uh, in the form of actual price of the product over total volume of the product. And as I mentioned, we're able to calculate per price promotion in the form of um, percentage of by using two variables, um, price in column D and original price in column D. So I guess I'll pause here and um, see if there are any questions or comments. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, I just want to acknowledge that you have two co-authors here, uh, Si Shang and um, we have uh, Zen Yang Qiu, who are doing a really amazing job in uh, answering the Q&A. So they have gone through a number, a number of questions, but we do have um, a couple, um, but maybe I'll give our discuss in just a few moments to ask some questions. Uh, yeah, thank you. This is this is really interesting. Um, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the um, you know the the programming? Then uh, you said I think you said that you can do this in Stata. Did I hear that mm -hmm. correctly? Uh, no, for the web scraping, you can do it either using um, a uh, an extension which is called a web scraper from on the, the browser from or you can use python so i think uh, the computer science scientists in our team they first tried to use the from extension and for websites they are they are unable to scrape using this extension then they went ahead and used the python code and after scraping this data you'll be able to like use a live code to sign uh, to save those data into csv file and then you can access it through Excel or you can import it into uh, software such as data for the clean and process the data for analysis. Okay. And um, is, uh, so once you kind of get this set up for one store, um, mm -hmm. how, how easy is it to then go to another store's website then? Like how much changing is there from store to store, if, if any? So that is a great question. So there were some challenges in terms of um, different stores can have different layouts or they choose to, you know, post product in, different product information in different locations. And some um, some websites could uh, choose to post more comprehensive, comprehensive information than the others or they can carry different product lines. So um, there are some differences um, in, in terms of like how to scrape from um, from different websites. So our computer scientists so basically looked into the source code and structure of the data so that uh, we together as a team figured out like which information we want to get and how to arrange them into like uh, data that is ready for use. Mm -hmm. And just to give people a sense of the time cost. So of uh, I guess of like setting it up originally for the first store and then doing it again for the second store. Um, okay, is there a way you could estimate the number of hours that would take a, a skilled programmer to do? So when we were starting um, on this project, I think at the beginning, it did took like um, several rounds of discussions, like weeks or even months to figure out what available information are there and how do we want to like extract and also code them into variables. So it did took us some efforts to do that. Uh, however, after we are able to develop the algorithms for um, each of the five stores in our, um, in our sample, then um, like later on, for example, we started from e-liquid products, um, then moving on to disposable and all the other products, it become uh, much easier because we can reuse, recycle our algorithms and also um, like over time we are able to, uh, I guess, find out the patterns across the websites. So like in the future, it also will be easier and more straightforward to scrape uh, information from the other stores, like more stores, maybe 10 or 15, 
more. And also, since we have all the all the like possible available information in mind, also the interesting variables. So that also like save us some time. So I think at this point, um, it takes I guess a couple of days to scrape data from a whole website because it does take machines some time to scrape all the web pages. Um, however, uh, the web scraping itself has become pretty standard. Mm -hmm. And um, is your research team, are you guys uh, going to be kind enough to make uh, an example of this uh, code available um, from one of your stores so that if other people want to web scrape, you know, a, a different stores than what, what you guys have done, they, they might be able to do that? That's a great question. I guess I'll consult with uh, our team PI to see if that's um, possible. Okay. And also, I think uh, there are readily available um, Python code online, like basically you can scrape any website using those tools and you can just modify a little bit to scrape data from other workshops. Okay. Yeah, so it, I can, uh, sorry, just to answer that question, that's a great question. I feel, you know, you always need to tweak uh, the scraping tool for uh, each website. So uh, there definitely is some marginal, marginal effort and cost needed to be able to expand this to other stores. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the uh, basics are there, and uh, it's quite common uh, for business to scrape uh, information from um, websites. So I guess the scraping tool itself is um, uh, quite widely available, uh, but uh, the, tweaks, the tweaks are needed for each website. Mm -hmm. Okay. And one final question. Um, are you able to capture a volume of sales um, or just product availability? So that's a great question. So it is one of uh, the limitations of our web sweeping tools. We are not able to capture um, transactions, sales. So that's why we feel like um, news and data is so important because it captures um, the sales in the e-cigarette market. And we hope to use web sweeping tools to like complement existing data sources. Okay, thank you. Great, thanks. Thank you so much, Mike, and uh, thank you to co-authors who are doing a fantastic job uh, cleaning out the Q&A. Um, to our audience members, please feel free to put your comments in the Q&A. We love to have your feedback and comments, but I think now we can uh, continue the presentation. Thank you. Great, thank you. So now I, I, I will move on to some of the analysis and results we did just to demonstrate uh, what kind of data you can get, what can you do with those data, uh, and what kind of results can you get. So here uh, I plot a box plot of the standardized e-liquid price um, in the unit of uh, US dollars per milliliter. So as you can see, e-liquids are very affordable in our sample across the five popular online web shops uh, that sell products to the, uh, across the US. And I further um, present this table of uh, percentiles to show you the e-liquid price distribution. So as you can see, uh, again, uh, e-liquid products are very cheap um, in the online market, and the 95 percentile, 95 percentile is only like 50 cents per milliliter. Now I'm gonna um, go ahead and show you the distribution of e-liquid volume per bottle, and I plotted a graph using um, chronodicity estimates. So we are able to plot this uh, distribution of uh, e-liquid volume per bottle for all the products from those five stores in our sample. And also we are able to find out um, the most common or the most frequent volume size. So um, the most frequent is uh, in 16 milliliter um, per bottle and 36% um, of the products in our sample are in that size. And what follows is 100 milliliter and 30 milliliter is also quite common, and there are 7% of the unique liquid products in our sample, they are in 120 milliliters. Now we are also able to um, document the price promotion strategies and practices across the five stores. So first we're able to calculate for each e-liquid product um, their percentage uh, of uh, as a form of price promotion. And also we have data um, on whether each e-liquid product is um, bundled. And also we were able to check site-wide discounts as well as their shipping policies. Um, so we did that at two time points, July 7th and September 12th, 2021. And also we are able to document 
um, there are quantity discounts in the form of 5x get y free. Now, as you can see, um, actually all five stores um, put at least some of their products on sales in the form of percentage off. Um, and four of the five stores uh, had site-wide discounts, so um, a discount for all the products uh, on their website. And four out of five stores uh, had free shipping policies at some point. And three of the stores um, used the strategy of product bundling, and we only um, documented one store uh, uh, that we find um, using the quantity discount strategy. And the discount is actually very uh, common and prevalent, uh, prevalent in those online workshops. And the average percentage off was close to 40% off. And we were also able to document the frequency of product sizes. So how many bottles in each liquid product and also the percentage of bundled products in each store. Now moving on to e-liquid flavors. So e-liquid e uh, flavors data does come in in a more complex form. So it is less straightforward uh, and takes more efforts um, to clean uh, compared to, for example, the press data. So what we did was we um, built our work on an existing uh, e-liquid flavor vocabulary that is um, published by um, in nicotine and tobacco research uh, in 2019. And as you can see uh, from this uh, uh, graph published in their paper, so there are these um, more inner circles, I guess. So those are the main categories, for example, fruit, dessert, candy, other sweets, etc. And also for fruit main category, they were also, um, they also classified fruit main category into several subcategories berries, citrus, tropical, and other fruit uh, flavors. And also in the uh, outer circle of this flavor wheel, you can see they, ad they identified um, those um, useful key terms um, as a part of their vocabulary to identify illegal flavors. Now, what we did is that we expanded uh, greatly on automatic flavor identification and categorization. So we expanded the flavor taxonomy using an existing database that is called WordNet. It is a commonly used database in the field of computer science. And we also developed algorithms to extract flavors from uh, the following sources. So we are able to extract flavor data from the source code of the web page uh, and also um, each online web shop could provide um, flavor filters so basically you can filter you can visit their store and filter by for example fruit flavor or tobacco flavor so we also uh, extracted um, information from those flavor filters to find out the classification of products listed in their website and also we are able to extract flavor information from product description box on this page. So description box does come in um, one or more paragraphs. Um, so we also used the technique of keyword matching to extract flavor information from those paragraphs. Now in terms of uh, flavor data hierarchy, so we greatly expanded the vocabulary and in total, we have currently 833 key terms. And building upon the existing flavor wheel, um, we modified the categorization a little bit. And what we did in our analysis is that we have these main categories, fruit, sweets, tobacco, menthol, spice, nut, coffee, or tea, alcohol, uh, and other beverages. And um, Again, under fruit main category, there are berry, citrus, tropical, and other fruits. So I want to talk a little bit about the flavor marketing observation in this process. So we observed that multiple flavored or a mix of flavors in one liquid bottle is actually quite common. And they're often mentioned in different placements 
such as flavor description, flavor filter, and marketing descriptions. So what you can see, for example, is like berries and menthol. So it is a mix of fruit uh, and menthol. We also observed that primary versus secondary flavors are often hard to distinguish in marketing description or flavor filter. And also we identified some concept flavors such as ice, uh, blue res, refresher associated with menthol flavors. Uh, now I want to show you um, in more details the rich information uh, from the liquid flavor data. So take this product as an example. So you can see that actually uh, it is common practice for online stores to actually put um, the fruits indicating their flavors uh, as a background behind the liquid product. And as you can see on this image, they also indicate the volume size and also showing that it is put on sale and original price was $24, but current price is only um, $14. And moving on to the right hand side of the, the screen, you can see that it has a short description uh, emphasizing um, this uh, tropical flavor in their illegal product. And then if you scroll down to the product description box, you can see that they went ahead and uh, talked about the flavors, the vaping experience um, very extensively. So they emphasized you no know, authentic topical and also they again talked about like juicy uh, strawberries, creamy coconut and sweet bananas. And you can see um, for the second red arrow, um, um, I'm highlighting that they also typically, we observe that they typically talk about the cloud uh, the cloud size um, of the wave and also uh, you know the flavor chasing blend so um, it seems that cloud size generated by those issues uh, is a quite important attribute and if you hold the scroll down actually they highlighted in red that um, their, uh, this product's vgpg is 75 over 25 and um, flavors uh, is a mix of strawberry coconut banana, banana and lime Now, when we code um, the e-liquid flavors as um, whether the product contains a certain flavor. So uh, as I showed you previously, like we have these main categories and subcategories. And um, shown on this uh, frequency plot, you can see that fruity flavors um, is actually very common prevalent in online stores. Um, and most of the e-liquids or a majority of the e-liquids in our sample um, at least contained uh, one of the fruity flavors and that can be mixed with, for example, menthol or spice or alcohol or other beverages. So what we did was that we used the method of double coding to get information on policy relevant packaging attributes. So we are interested in the placement of warnings, essentially whether the package image has a warning and if so, where is it? Is it from top, from bottom or on the side? And we're interested in the colors of the package because colors um, potentially could communicate um, the electric flavors. And also we are interested in how um, the manufacturers describe the electric flavor on the package. And in our preliminary data analysis, so this is data from store one, um, we are able to see, for example, 466 images um, have warnings on the front bottom. And actually we see 127 images um, has no warnings at all. Now we're also able to apply um, data visualization tools and algorithms uh, in the field of computer science so for example, we can extract information from package images. So here, this example shows the colors that you can extract from the image. And also, it'll be able to um, help you find out uh, whether there is a label and also where, uh, where is the warning label. Using those tools, we can automatically parse out information and we can extract 
um, data such as package um, colors, and we can also extract information on the layout. So what we did was we combined uh, machine coding with human coding. So we had two human coders who code information independently, and then we compare the results from human coding with machine coding to improve the accuracy. So the demonstration in today's workshop um, does focus on ubiquitous. So I want to talk a little bit about our web data by uh, Instagram product tests. So we squeak and analyze the ubiquitous as the first step because um, e-liquid products are typically not well captured in news and data, and also it could be hard. It could be hard to code the volume size of e-liquid bottles. So this um, product type is where we think web scraping could potentially make the greatest contribution. However, we do have um, other product uh, data extracted from the web. Um, so we have data on disposables and cartridge-based e-cigarettes, and they are typically measured in use and data. And also we have data on storage keys and devices that are used with e-liquids. And also we have data on CDD products carried by those on our workshops. Now in terms of um, the distribution of nicotine strength in the unit of milli, uh, milligram per milliliter, uh, among the e-liquid products in our sample. So most commonly, uh, they are in either a nicotine-free form or in three milliliter, uh, sorry, three milligram or in six uh, milligram. But you do see about a quarter of the e-liquid products in our sample are actually um, in very high nicotine strength from uh, 12 milligram per milliliter to all the way up to uh, 50 milligram per milliliter. And the average nicotine strength is 12 milligram per milliliter. So we were interested in the nicotine form, whether it's nicotine free or salt or free base. So we were able to identify those information from the web data. And we see that 52% of the e-liquids in our sample are in free base. And about a quarter um, of um, the products in our sample are in salts and uh, the other core is in nicotine free. Also, we are able to plot um, the VGPG ratios distribution in a bite chart. So about half of the e-liquids are in 70 over 30 VGPG ratio. And also what is um, common is 50 over 50 um, and uh, 80 over 20 and 75 over uh, 25. So nicotine form and VGPG are important attributes of e-liquid products because as we know, nicotine salts are less bitter and harsh than free base uh, nicotine e-liquids. So they could be more ex uh, attractive, especially to um, new users of e who are experimenting with e-liquids. And VGPG ratio is also important because higher the VGPG ratio and bigger the vapor clouds and the cloud size uh, seems to be a very important attribute to e cigarette users. Another analysis that we are able to do using our web app data is we could estimate the willingness to pay. So we know that um, through stated preference data and applying uh, discrete choice models uh, at hypothetical settings, uh, willingness to pay could be estimated. And we could also use the review preference data from um, to scraping those online stores and we can apply hydronic price model. So what we did was we used those observational data to uh, estimate willingness to pay and measure the relative importance of product attributes. And specifically our equation looks like this. So it is a log linear equation and we are regressing standardized electric price on including strength Including form, VGPG, and flavors. Oh, Dr. Ma, pardon me. I just we have about 15 minutes left. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks. So we did control for stall fixed effects and uh, coefficients of interest better one to better four indicates the percentage change in the standardized price of e-liquids in response to the change uh, in a specific product attributes. Uh, attributes sorry. To briefly show you our results. 
So we estimated the associations between illiquid prices and nicotine form, and price quite strikingly, uh, relative to nicotine-free illiquids, nicotine salts are priced uh, about 30% higher uh, holding the other attributes constant. And this is um, quite consistent with what is documented in literature uh, about the features of nicotine salts and also uh, the market observation, for example, the uptake of nicotine salts sold by Joule. We also estimated uh, among the nicotine salts the associations between illiquid prices and flavors. So we do see some uh, modest effects. Um, so we see that relative to illiquid of tobacco flavor or unflavored, for example, menthol is priced about 3% higher. So the other to do the quantitative data analysis and uh, use hydronic pricing model. So we did um, further process the data and coded the flavors into mutually exclusive uh, categories. So keep in mind that most e-liquid products um, in our data do contain at least one uh, flavor, uh, fruit flavor, and it could be mixed with, for example, sweets or menthol. So that could potentially be, uh, be the reason why we actually do not see much statistically significant associations between electric prices and flavors among the nicotine free or free based uh, nicotine effects. And we want to highlight uh, this observation that most electrics in those five online um, popular online web shops contain fruity flavors. And this is relevant to the current uh, policy environment. In January 2021, FDA issued warnings to firms that um, produce and sold illiquids online without a PMTA um, by September 9th, 2021 deadline. And in our script data, of which we script from February to May 2021, we observed 241 different illiquid brands remained in the market, and only about 3% of those products are nicotine free. So we do want to keep monitoring the brand availability in online stores and provide data on the enforcement of policy and also changes in the online market in response to the policies. Also what is relevant is that in April 2022, FDA issued two proposals that if those proposals um, lead to policy actions, those proposals would ban mental flavor in cigarettes, uh, in cigarettes and also all non tobacco flavors in cigars. So that could potentially incentivize the transition of um, users from combustible smoking to e cigarette use. And we know that flavor is a main reason of uh, why adolescents and adults are exper experimenting with e cigarettes. And we know that earlier FDA banned flavors other than menthol, maintain tobacco in cartridge based e cigarettes. And what follows is that we saw sales growth in disposables such as popcorns. So we do want to add, add, uh, assess the importance of flavors to product popularity and also we, can, we want to keep monitoring the online market and see what are the most common, common available flavors uh, in, in liquid products so the online market. And hopefully we can inform uh, about the impact of flavor bans or restrictions. Now, um, as I previously mentioned when, when answering Mike's question, so our data does have some limitations. So first, obviously, it only captures the online market. And second, unlike sales data from Nielsen, we do not have, ex, uh, do not have information on sales or transactions. So our goal is that while scraping could potentially serve as a cheaper alternative tool, to help us obtain data that complements existing data sources and improve the comprehensiveness of e cigarette research data. Now, there, there are quite a few possibilities um, that we can do in the future. So first, um, with data on online source traffic, we will be able to improve the sampling 
So we will be able to know over time which stores have the highest traffic, which stores are the most popular stores uh, in, in our market. And we can use those to, uh, web scraping tools to obtain a great amount of data um, that contain rich and in-depth product level information. We do want to expand our efforts to scrape data from more than five stores. And we would like um, to use those web data to hopefully serve as a complementary source to retail scanner data. And we can also do content analysis on consumer ratings and reviews. Uh, in a way, those data uh, reflect cons consumer preferences and we're interested in knowing what a specific consumer like or dislike about uh, some product and which attributes are important to them. And we can also use algorithms to continue to extract information from um, package images. So I guess that concludes uh, my demonstration in this workshop. Uh, feel free to ask some questions or comments. And also, uh, one thing to note is that after the cleaning and analysis of uh, all of our data, we will publish all the data with our um, peer reviewed research papers. So um, be sure to keep following our web streaming efforts if you, if you are interested. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ma. I think we'll turn this over to our discussant, uh, Mike. And after that, we'll have some questions from the audience. I love the QR codes. Um, that that's great. Um, just uh, one. Um, just thinking about how you know we might use this uh, like as quasi kind of experimentalist, right? I mean, it seems like one um, you know nice feature of your data is it really captures kind of changes in product availability uh, nationally, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it's useful to study the effect of FDA regulation nationally than on you know what products are online, right? Um, uh, you know, with some things like flavor bans and taxes and whatnot, um, th these are state level regulations, right? And so I'm wondering, is it possible to use uh, web scraping uh, algorithms? And then pr probably at some point in the process of purchasing, you'd be asked to identify what state you, you live in, right? And, and I'm curious what would happen. Um, I mean, like if there's a tax, you know, how do they... Is, is it possible to capture them based on what you say the state is where you live? Is it possible then to see what amount they want to add uh, for the tax? And if it's a flavored product and there's a flavor ban in that state, does the uh, store not uh, proceed with that transaction? Is it possible to capture any of that complexity or would that be kind of too difficult for a web scraping algorithm? That, that, those are great questions, and uh, it is a great point, uh, as I pointed out, uh, about the quasi experimental design. So, uh, another ongoing research effort is that we also want to improve our sampling by, um, by getting data, collecting data from a state level popular uh, specialty big shops that both have, have both a physical location and also their own source. So, hopefully, that would help us uh, get a representative. Uh, sample of uh, state level popular with shops um, to do some analysis. And also keep in mind that uh, especially after uh, using the organic store traffic, we'll be able to uh, scrape a, a sig significant portion of the online market, uh, all of their products um, sold in those most popular online stores over time. So we can also, I guess, observe uh, the product information, marketing, uh, when with some policy changes and see how those uh, you know store owners or manufacturers react uh, in terms of uh, available products and how they market. And uh, I guess for your uh, last question in terms of um, how we can like check the state of residence and see um, you know how those uh, product data change uh, in, in response to state level policy. So actually. We just published one, one of our papers at um, Tobacco Control, which actually looked at um, the tax compliance. So we were able to add the checkout to that page um, to like uh, both using um, manual, manual labor and also using algorithms. We were able to you know, cross verify and by entering different addresses and see uh, how the store websites charge taxes. And we know that there is a quite complicated tax structure across states in the US uh, and some states, um, you know, don't have uh, access taxes on e-cigarettes or they could, some states could um, ban the shipping of e-cigarette products. So we were able to capture um, those data to see 
um, you know, how the stores comply to taxation and we'll be able to continue this effort over time to monitor um, how this changes. Great, thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, again, your co-authors have done a really wonderful job of keeping the Q&A clear, uh, but we uh, do have a question from uh, Rajani. Uh, good study, Dr. Ma. Uh, what do you think on product preference by purchaser will differ in the, on, uh, in the online or in the store purchase? Um, that's a great question. So um, I guess uh, we can get a sense of consumer preferences um, through like analyzing the review comments and also you know, through those self-reported data um, in, in surveys, we'll be able to get a sense in terms of, you know, the preferred the purchasing channel um, by, by age group. By, demo, by adults, by older adults. Um, so I guess that would give um, us a sense of the potential consumers um, in online you know, shops. So my connection is a little bit unstable. So hopefully, hopefully you can hear me clearly. Um, so yeah, we, we do think there could be some differences in terms of like who's purchasing in the online market versus who's you know visiting brick and mortar stores and who's going to the specialty group shops. Thank you. And then just one final question from one of our own uh, our panelists, our, our MC, Dr. Alex Lieber. Uh, he has a question about, has free shipping continued after the PAC as PACT Act was passed? Uh, that's a great question. So if you go to our uh, tobacco control papers, so we actually talked, uh, discussed a little bit about, you know, how they comply, how those stores comply after um, uh, that uh, amendment of that act to include uh, e-cigarettes. So we actually uh, see, you know, uh, when we entered addresses in the checkout of the store uh, webpage, some of them are showing, you know, this product cannot be shipped to this state. And also one of the rules of this amendment is that they can no longer use USPS. So they have to use commercial shipping services. Um, but we do see that, you know, like mostly those products can be widely shipped to um, like, different states in the US, not necessarily using USPS, but they seems that they have uh, found out ways to use commercial services to ship their products. Great. Uh, thank you for those fa this fantastic presentation and you have done a fantastic job with the Q&A as have your co-authors, so thanks so much. Thank you. All right, well, we are out of time. Uh, thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. Uh, thank you to the audience of uh, 140 people for your participation, uh, and have a top-snotch weekend. Cheers. <laughs>